we've got this lovely fire pit on our patio, but what about when it rains? Since we already have a pond, we're going to make a cover, which is a great excuse for us to experiment with router jigs. Our plan is to make this cover a convex dome so it sheds the rain. Let's get to it! Thinking about it, it sounds like we need a lazy Susan and a router jig. First up, let's glue up a panel. We used leftover Scots pine from the patio table we made in the last video. This should match nicely with the table, although sitting here with the benefit of hindsight, I can tell you the reduced stability of soft wood is not ideal. The leftover stock we had wasn't in the best condition. We're talking knots, damaged edges and visible heartwood. So not a huge problem on an experimental project like this, but we were still careful how we ordered the boards. As we're making a dome, we'll be removing more material from the perimeter than the centre. That means the best sections go in the centre and we put our defects to the outside to where we'll be cutting it away. We also won't be using any biscuits or dominoes in the glue up. We don't want to run the risk of accidentally exposing them when we cut the dome. So some waterproof type bond 3 wood glue and an edge to edge bond should be perfectly strong. And with a little YouTube magic, the glue is dry and we're ready to turn this panel into a circle. To make the circle, we'll be using the 6-in-1 router jig from Tamar at 3x3 Custom. Thank you, Tamar. The jig is pretty smart and can be configured to work without a hole in the centre, but seeing as it was the first time we're using the jig and we thought we might reference the centre later on, we decided it was easier and safer to drill the hole. The jig is a bit of a transformer, and in this configuration we cut the outside perimeter. As the material was thick, we only cut about halfway through. We haven't cut many circles like this before, and we were pleasantly surprised just how easy and accurate it was. It was really fun as well, so we need to find more excuses to make circular things. We then moved on to cut a groove with a round nose cutter. The rim of the fire pit will seat in this groove, as well as serve as a drip stop to stop any water finding its way into the fire pit. The moment of truth. Did we cut the groove at the right diameter? Yes, we did. Now using a jigsaw, we trim the remaining material around the perimeter and tidy up the edge with a flush trim router bit. It looked so good here, we were actually really tempted to stop. But a plan is a plan, and if we're anything, we are sticklers to a plan. Okay, so let me try and explain our idea. Our concept for the jig is to have two curved rails above the fire pit cover. The router will move along these rails to cut an arc. We'll mount the cover on a bearing from the Lazy Susan so that it can rotate. We'll then create the dome by setting the router at a point on the arc and spinning the cover one revolution. Then we'll move the router up the rail a small amount and repeat. By doing this enough times, we will create a dome shape. Now, there are a few challenges we need to overcome, and this is where CAD modelling really comes into its own. We can throw all of our critical dimensions at a drawing, and the geometry will dictate to us how we need to make the jig. So, first challenge, what radius should the dome be? Now, this is governed a little by aesthetics, but largely how thick the starting material is and how much we want left at the perimeters. The second challenge, how will we guide the writer to move in the required arc? We've already said rails, but the router can't move forwards or backwards, nor can it rock. It also needs to sit as low as possible. And that ties into the final challenge. The router and router bit will only be able to cut a certain depth, and that depth will need to be equal or greater than the maximum cut depth on the dome plus the height of the jig itself. Given we want the jig to be sturdy, it will need to have as much material as we can give it without making it too tall to work. So, easy, right? After a little back and forth, we decided the best way to guide the router was using the guide rods that it came with. These will keep the router as low as possible, and the base of it can also sit between the rails to restrict any forward-backward movement. Also, being two cylinders mean that the router will stay stable on the arc. By mocking up both the cover and the router in CAD, we can see how tall and at what arc we need to make the rails. So to draw the correct radius onto the rails, I left Michael to it and he came up with this harebrained scheme. First he measured out the radius using a laser and tape measure, 
then put a screw in our desk at a measured point and using the old string technique, drew an arc. We then cut out the arc at the bandsaw, sanded smooth, and copied and pasted at the router table. Using centre marks on the base of the cover, we secured the Lazy Susan with a few short screws. Then we marked a cross on the top surface of the cover. Now we can bring in the magically assembled router jig and align it to the cover using that cross to keep things centred. The important part of this jig is that the Lazy Susan cover and jig must all have the same centre point. We then screw the jig down to stop any movement. Hands up if you can spot a problem. It quickly became abundantly clear that this was not going to work. These bearings are designed to be secured to both sides, but access holes need to be drilled through one part. Given we didn't much feel like drilling four big holes in either the cover nor our workbench, we had to get creative. Thankfully, the solution was a simple one. We cut a circular puck the same size as the hole in the centre of the bearing, then at the same centre point as everything else, screwed it to the workbench. We then dropped the cover on top of it, and all was right in the world again. Well, not everything. The cover still had a little uppy downy play where the router would be cutting. So to stop this, we placed a little finger underneath to remove the wobble. For the router bit, we used this one inch surfacing bit. We shopped around a bit for the right cutter. It was important that it was able to cut when plunging as well as in horizontal movement. Our thinking was that a one inch cutter was probably safer than anything larger. And given we were unsure how much abuse the cutter might experience, we thought it important to get something higher quality. Speaking with the benefit of hindsight now, I can thoroughly recommend this cutter. And with the rails on the router, we are almost ready. Just need to add these spacers that keep the router centered between the rails and we are good to go. So I was all set to start there, router in hand, when Dora popped in and quite rightly pointed out that my curve is pretty rubbish. There's a high point or a low point here, I'm not sure which, which I think when duplicated around the circumference is going to become pretty obvious and pretty ugly. So um, I think this is probably a consequence of my string technique. Um, although it's a reasonable technique, over a three meter length, the string is very stretchy and um, there was just a, that just led to a very wobbly line and, and then I cut a very wiggly line um, as a result. So thankfully I've cut the arc curve on this side but this side's still square so I'm going to try a different technique and um, hopefully get the right curve this time. As is so often the case, the best solution is also the easiest solution. Lofting is a drafting technique used to generate a perfect curve from a few key reference points. It's used a lot in traditional boat building and one we've seen used many times by Leo on his channel, um, Samson Boat Company. Frustrating we didn't think of it sooner, but glad to have a solution. All we needed to do was mark the depth of the arc onto the jig, a measurement we got from the CAD model. We then secured a thin strip of MDF at these marks, and the MDF naturally forms a curve giving us the perfect arc. Again, another bit of YouTube magic and we have our jig. This time, with a perfect arc. With everything good to go, we put the router on the rails and moved it into position. We thought starting at the outside with a shallow pass was the best place to start. It was slightly nerve-wracking to start with, Although we tried to cover all bases, we did have concerns that the router might move or it could potentially grab the cover and spin it out of control. We covered these concerns by clamping the router to the rails and working together. Michael was in charge of the router while I rotated the cover, being sure to rotate clockwise against the cutting force. We also started out with a shallow pass to get the feel for things. With one rotation done, we could plunge the router further and do another pass. We thought the best approach would be to remove the bulk of material first, leaving just one mill or so that we could remove at the end. 
the thinking being that this would give us the best surface finish. Setting the right depth was easy. Off camera we moved the router to the centre of the cover and moved the cutter down to 1mm above the surface. We then locked in the depth stop so we could repeatedly return to that depth. It was then just a case of incrementally moving the router along and repeating. Each time we move along it was a little less than the radius of the cutter. This worked very well and we were soon moving quickly. We were really pleased to find the jig worked perfectly. It was effortless to remove material and it left a really good surface finish. As we went on we became more relaxed about removing greater amounts of material in one pass. Every time the router just kept cutting like a hot knife through butter. In hindsight, we could have potentially used a larger diameter cutter to speed things up, but it really didn't take that long and we're yet to test this with a hardwood so perhaps the smaller cutter was best. So that was going fantastically um, until it wasn't. Um, our plan there was to router all the way up the surface and then just do one final one mil pass to, to get a really nice surface finish at the end. But what happened is I think when we went for a coffee break and when there wasn't the material to support it anymore, the, the whole um, circle has warped a little bit. And so when we did our one mil pass just round here, in places it's perfectly at one mil. In other places we've got like almost six mil of removal. Um, and that's because here it's nice and tight against our peg, whereas over here there's a blatant wobble to it all. So um, we looked at different solutions. We were trying to run a caster maybe to hold this down, um, and that would solve it. The problem is, is there wouldn't be enough space to get the caster and the router in, and we could run the caster here, but then that doesn't really solve the wobble issue. So what we're going to do instead is cut our losses. We're going to put a round over on this edge here and we're just going to sand this off because actually our, our surface finish at the moment is pretty good. What a pain, eh? In hindsight, we should have just gone to the final depth on the first pass and we'd have avoided all of these problems. It always amazes us how much wood can move and how much internal stress it can be under. If this piece really mattered to us, we'd, well, we'd remake it, or we'd maybe look at inlaying a piece of wood in the worst affected areas, then machining the round and dome shape. But seeing as this is just an experiment, we're happy to slap some wood filler in and call it a day. Our hope being that none or very little will be visible once we add a round over. And there you have it. You'd never know. It just needs a final sand and boom, we have a perfect dome shape. We're really pleased and wondering how we might apply this to other projects. Any ideas, folks? Unfortunately, the cover is still warped, but we can fix that with this brace on the underside. We glued and screwed this, which, yes, is not the best plan for future movement, but honestly, we ran out of time and this'll do for now. To do it properly, we wouldn't use glue and we'd either drill the outside holes as slots or better yet, create a sliding dovetail for the brace. We might even have added the stabilising brace before we'd started cutting the dome. We're going to chalk up this experiment as a success. The jig worked perfectly, very accurate, great surface finish and was much faster than we had anticipated. Also, it could easily be modified to create any flowing curve, maybe a wave shape or any of these. One big learning moment was how important it is to appreciate the stability of the material that you're working with. When we do this again in the future, we'll certainly keep this in mind. The good news is there are plenty of ways to deal with it. Let us know if you found this video useful. There are so many applications that it can be used for and we're always keen to know what you guys are making. Ta-da! It fits perfectly! and it sheds the rain, so job done, gold star. As always, if you enjoyed the video or learned something new, a thumbs up and a subscribe go a long way for us. We're still trying to navigate this YouTube algorithm and get ourselves known, so any support is much appreciated. Until next time, folks, cheerio.